Mother wanted to ruin our lives because I did not meet her standards. When my grandfather helped us, he had a stroke. And then I, my name is Ethan, and I never thought I'd be in a position where my marriage would cause this much tension with my family. It's not like I grew up in a household filled with constant battles, but I guess sometimes when people come from different worlds, it's inevitable. Let me start from the beginning, because things didn't get messy overnight. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, in one of those picturesque suburban neighborhoods where every lawn was neatly manicured, and each house was a piece of architectural art. My parents, William and Charlotte, were well off, to say the least. Dad was a successful attorney, and Mom had her own interior design firm. Growing up in that environment meant that I was used to a certain way of living. Big family holidays with extravagant meals, luxurious vacations in places like the south of France, and a steady parade of well-heeled guests at our home. Our house, or more accurately our mansion, was a sprawling brick colonial, three stories tall, complete with a massive backyard and the kind of furniture people usually just look at but never actually use. But it was more than just the material things. My parents were proud of their accomplishments and took a lot of pride in maintaining the image of a perfect family. They held themselves to a certain standard, and by extension, they held me to the same standard. I was their only child, the golden boy, and they had big plans for me. My future, according to them, involved marrying someone of equal standing someone who could carry the family legacy and fit seamlessly into the life they had built. But then I met Mia. Mia was different. I don't mean that in a cliched way, either. She wasn't just different from the girls my parents had envisioned for me. She was different from everyone I had ever known. We met in college. I went to Yale, obviously, because that's what you do when your family is deeply rooted in prestige. Mia, on the other hand, attended a state school nearby. She was studying sociology, and we crossed paths when we both volunteered at the same local outreach program. From the first conversation, it was clear that she wasn't like the polished, preppy girls I had been surrounded by my whole life. She was down-to-earth, practical, and had this way of seeing the world that was both refreshing and slightly unsettling at the same time. Where I had been trained to value status and success, Mia valued people. She cared about things that didn't come with a price tag. We fell in love fast. I think part of what drew me to her was how different she was from my world. Being with her felt like a rebellion, in the best way possible. She didn't care about the things my family cared about, and that was exciting to me. She wasn't impressed by money or status. Instead, she was passionate about helping people and making a difference. It was intoxicating, and before I knew it, we were inseparable. Of course, I knew from the start that introducing Mia to my parents would be tricky, but I wasn't prepared for just how bad it would get. It started subtly. The first time Mia met my parents, I could sense the tension. We were sitting in the living room of the mansion, which was always spotless, thanks to my mother's insistence that everything be perfect. Mia seemed out of place in that setting. Her casual sundress clashed with the formal atmosphere and her easygoing nature was a stark contrast to the stiff formality of my parents. I could see the judgment in my mom's eyes, though she was too polite to say anything outright. Dad was more subtle about it, but I could feel his disapproval in the way he asked her questions, prodding at her background and family in a way that was meant to remind her of the gap between our worlds. Mia's parents were solid middle-class folks. Her dad was a mechanic, and her mom worked at a local bakery. They lived in a modest house in a small town about an hour away. Mia didn't grow up with the kind of luxury that I had, and I think my parents saw that as a problem. They saw her as unequal to me, not in terms of personality or values, but in terms of status. And that's what really got under my skin. I loved her, and that should have been enough, but for my parents, it wasn't. After that first meeting, my mom started dropping hints, subtle suggestions that maybe Mia wasn't the right fit for me. She never said anything outright, but I could feel it in the way she would mention how well-matched my old high school girlfriend, Olivia, and I had been. Olivia, of course, had come from a family much like ours, wealthy, well-connected, and prestigious. My parents adored her, and though we'd broken up years ago, it was clear they'd never quite gotten over it. Mia, on the other hand, was a completely different story. She wasn't interested in fancy parties or networking with my parents' high society friends. 
She didn't care about the labels on her clothes or the price of the wine being served at dinner. To her, those things didn't matter. And while I found that refreshing, my parents saw it as a red flag. As time went on, the tension between Mia and my parents became more palpable. My mom, in particular, started to make her disapproval more obvious. She would invite Mia and me over for dinner and then spend the entire evening talking about how important it was to keep up appearances and maintain certain standards in life. It was her way of trying to tell me that Mia didn't belong. I think she hoped that by constantly reminding me of what she considered important, I would eventually see things her way and break things off with Mia. But I didn't. If anything, it made me more determined to make it work with Mia. When we got engaged, things took a turn for the worse. My parents were outwardly supportive, but I could tell they were disappointed. They put on a good face for the public, but behind closed doors, my mom would constantly question whether I was sure about my decision. She would drop subtle hints about how marriage was a big commitment and how I needed to be with someone who could support me in the lifestyle I was accustomed to. Mia and I moved into a small, cozy apartment on the outskirts of New Haven. It wasn't anything like the house I had grown up in, but it was ours, and we loved it. We were happy there, building our life together, and for a while, I managed to convince myself that the growing tension with my parents would eventually ease up. Maybe they just needed time to adjust to the idea of Mia being a permanent part of my life. But then the real problem started. It began with the wedding planning. My mom insisted on being involved in every detail, which, on the surface, seemed like she just wanted to help. But it quickly became clear that she saw it as an opportunity to take control. She started pushing for an extravagant ceremony, complete with a guest list filled with people Mia and I barely knew but who were important to my parents. Mia, meanwhile, wanted something simple and intimate. She wanted a small ceremony with close family and friends, something that reflected who we were as a couple. I tried to play the middleman, but it quickly became a battle of wills. My mom saw Mia's desire for a smaller wedding as an affront to our family's reputation. She accused Mia of trying to shrink the wedding because she wasn't comfortable with the kind of people we would be inviting, people with money and influence. Mia, on the other hand, saw my mom's insistence on a large, showy wedding as a sign that she didn't respect our relationship. She felt like my mom was trying to make the day about her and her image, rather than about us and our love. It all came to a head one night when my mom made a comment about how Mia's family wouldn't be able to contribute much financially to the wedding. She didn't mean it to sound cruel, but it hit a nerve with Mia, who had always been sensitive about the economic gap between our families. That was the first time I saw Mia cry over something my parents had said, and it killed me. She tried to brush it off, saying that she didn't care what my mom thought, but I knew it hurt her deeply. Still, we moved forward with the wedding plans. I tried to keep the peace, but I was caught between the woman I loved and the family I'd grown up with. It felt like no matter what I did, someone would end up hurt. After the wedding planning debacle, things seemed to calm down for a brief moment. The wedding day finally arrived, and despite all the tension leading up to it, it was beautiful. Mia and I exchanged vows in a small, intimate ceremony at a vineyard just outside of town. It wasn't the extravagant event my mom had envisioned but it was exactly what we wanted, quiet, personal, and filled with people who truly mattered to us. My parents showed up, of course, but their disappointment lingered beneath the surface. I could see it in the way my mom scanned the guest list, mentally comparing it to the names she'd hoped to invite. My dad was more subtle, making small talk, but keeping his distance from Mia's family. Despite everything, the day was perfect for Mia and me. We were married, and for a moment, it felt like nothing could touch us. But as the days turned into weeks, reality started to set in. My parents didn't let go of their reservations about Mia, and things only got more complicated as we settled into married life. We had both saved up a bit of money before the wedding. I had some savings from my work in finance, and Mia, ever frugal, had been putting money aside since her first job. After a few months of living in our little apartment, we decided it was time to take the next step buying a house. It wasn't going to be anything like the mansion I grew up in, of course, but we were both excited to find a place we could truly call our own. We started looking at houses in and around New Haven. The market was tough. Decent homes and good neighborhoods were selling fast, and prices were steep. We had a budget of $450,000,
which I thought was reasonable for a first home. Mia, being cautious with money, was insistent that we stay well within our budget, while I was a bit more willing to stretch it for the right place. It was during this time that my parents decided to step in again, uninvited. One afternoon, while Mia and I were touring a modest three-bedroom house just outside of downtown, my phone buzzed. It was my mom, insisting that we come over for dinner that evening. When we arrived, it quickly became clear that this wasn't just a casual family dinner. My parents had something planned. After some pleasantries, they sat us down in the living room, and my dad started talking about how important it was for us to start off on the right foot as a married couple. I immediately sensed where this was going. He talked about how real estate was an investment and how we shouldn't settle for something less than what we deserved. Then came the offer. They wanted to help us buy a house. At first, it sounded generous, more than generous, actually. My parents were willing to put down a large chunk of money, $250,000 to be exact, to help us get a bigger house, one that would match the lifestyle they believed I should have. It sounded like a gift, but I knew better. Nothing came without strings in my family. Mia sat quietly beside me, and I could feel the tension building in her. I knew she wouldn't be comfortable accepting such a large sum of money from my parents, and truthfully, I wasn't either. It felt like their way of controlling us, of making sure that even in this new phase of our lives, we would still be tied to their expectations. Sure enough, my mom started talking about how important it was to live in the right neighborhood, surrounded by people who could help us in the future. She mentioned a specific area in town, one where homes went for upwards of $700,000 and where many of my parents' friends and business associates lived. I could see what was happening. If we accepted the money, it wouldn't just be a gift, it would come with expectations. We'd be expected to live in the kind of neighborhood they approved of, in a house that fit their image of success. Mia and I would never have full control over our lives, because we'd always be beholden to them in some way. I politely declined their offer that night, saying that Mia and I were happy to find something within our budget. My parents didn't take it well. My mom made a comment about how we were being stubborn and how it would be foolish not to take advantage of their generosity. My dad, ever the pragmatist, told me to think of it as a strategic investment for our future. But Mia and I left that night without any intentions of taking the money. It was the first time I felt the weight of the divide between my wife and my family. In the following weeks, Mia and I found a house, a modest but charming two-story home on the outskirts of town. It wasn't flashy, but it was perfect for us. The mortgage was manageable, and it felt good to know that we'd done it on our own. The house cost $410,000, leaving us a little wiggle room for renovations, which Mia was excited to take on. She had always dreamed of making a place her own, and this house had so much potential. But as soon as we moved in, the real trouble began. My parents, particularly my mom, were unimpressed. They came over to see the place a week after we'd moved in, and from the moment they walked through the door, I could sense the disapproval. My mom made comments about how the rooms were a bit small, and how the backyard could use some work. My dad, ever the diplomat, tried to stay neutral, but even he couldn't hide his disappointment. To them, it wasn't just about the house. It was about the fact that we hadn't followed their advice, that we'd chosen to forge our own path. Then came the first major conflict. Mia and I had been living in the house for about a month when my parents announced that they were throwing a large party at their mansion. It was a charity fundraiser they held every year, and they expected us to attend, as we always had in the past. I hadn't even mentioned it to Mia yet when my mom called to remind us of the event. It was clear that they expected us to show up, dress to the nines, and play the part of the perfect couple in their carefully curated social world. But Mia didn't want to go. She was uncomfortable with those kinds of events, and I couldn't blame her. The charity aspect was genuine, but the guest list was always filled with the same crowd of wealthy, high-society people who treated these events more like networking opportunities than actual charity work. Mia, who spent her days volunteering at local shelters and working on grassroots community projects, didn't feel like she fit in with that world. And honestly, I didn't either anymore. When I told my mom that we wouldn't be attending, she was furious. She didn't say it outright, but I could hear the anger in her voice. She made a few passive-aggressive remarks about how Mia was changing me and how I used to care about these things. It was clear that in her mind, 
Mia was the reason I was pulling away from the family's traditions. To her, Mia was the one who was causing the rift, when in reality, it was my parents' inability to accept that I had chosen a different path. After that, things between Mia and my parents became even more strained. They started visiting less frequently, and when they did, it was always awkward. My mom would make pointed comments about how I never had time for family anymore, and my dad would ask passive questions about our finances, clearly trying to hint that we were being irresponsible by not taking their money. Then, one day, out of nowhere, I got a call from Olivia. Yes, that Olivia. My high school girlfriend, the one my parents had always adored. She had just moved back to New Haven after living in Boston for a few years, and she wanted to catch up. It felt strange, hearing from her after so many years, but I agreed to meet for coffee. When I told Mia about the meeting, she wasn't thrilled, but she trusted me. She knew that Olivia was part of my past, not my future, and I assured her that it was just a friendly catch-up. But I should have known that nothing involving Olivia and my family would ever be that simple. When I met Olivia, it was like stepping into a time machine. She hadn't changed much. Still beautiful, still polished, still the epitome of the kind of woman my parents would have loved for me to marry. We talked about old times, reminiscing about high school and the years we'd spent together before going our separate ways. She had just gone through a breakup and was moving back to New Haven to start fresh. But then she dropped the bombshell. Apparently, she had already run into my parents, at a charity event, no less, and they had mentioned that Mia and I were having some challenges. I was floored. My parents had never said anything to me about this, but clearly, they had been talking behind our backs, and now Olivia was implying that they were concerned about my marriage. I felt a knot in my stomach as I realized what was happening. My parents were still holding on to the idea that Olivia was somehow the right match for me, and they were using her to drive a wedge between Mia and me. Olivia didn't say anything outright, but I could tell from the way she spoke that she believed there was still something between us, that maybe, just maybe, I had made a mistake by choosing Mia. When I got home that evening, I was furious. Not at Mia, but at my parents. It was clear now that they hadn't given up on their campaign to undermine my marriage, and I didn't know what to do. I loved Mia, but I was starting to realize just how far my parents were willing to go to push her out of my life. After that meeting with Olivia, things started to spiral in ways I hadn't anticipated. I was caught between two worlds, my parents and their relentless push to mold me into someone I wasn't, and my life with Mia, which felt real and grounded, but increasingly threatened by the undercurrents of my family's interference. I didn't mention the conversation with Olivia to Mia right away, partly because I didn't want to upset her, and partly because I was still processing it myself. I kept thinking about what Olivia had said, how my parents had implied we were having challenges. It felt like a betrayal, and it made me question everything they had been saying and doing over the last few months. How much of their concern was genuine, and how much was a calculated attempt to drive a wedge between me and Mia? About a week after the Olivia incident, I got an unexpected phone call from my grandfather. My grandfather, Henry, was my dad's father, and though he lived a few hours away in upstate New York, we had always been close. Unlike my parents, he wasn't flashy or concerned with appearances. He had worked his whole life as a carpenter and had retired in a small, quiet town with my grandmother. They lived a simple life, far removed from the pretentiousness that seemed to dominate my parents' world. Grandpa Henry had always been someone I could talk to, someone who understood that life wasn't about money or status. Growing up, I had spent summers with him, learning how to build things with my hands and listening to his stories about when he was young, how he had met my grandmother, and how they had built their life together from almost nothing. His wisdom had always been a grounding force for me, and in that moment, I needed it more than ever. When he called, he didn't waste any time. He asked how things were going with Mia. And though I tried to brush it off at first, it became clear that he already knew something was wrong. Apparently, my mom had called him, expressing concerns about my marriage. But unlike Olivia, Grandpa wasn't easily swayed by my parents' narrative. He wanted to hear my side of the story, so I told him everything, about how my parents had been trying to interfere, about the pressure to live up to their expectations, and about Olivia's unexpected return to the picture. Grandpa Henry listened without interrupting, and when I was done, he let out a long sigh. 
I could almost hear him shaking his head through the phone. He told me something I'll never forget. Son, a marriage isn't about who has the biggest house or the most money. It's about who you can see yourself sitting with on the front porch when you're 80 years old, still enjoying each other's company. Don't let anyone, not even your parents, tell you what kind of life you should have. It was exactly what I needed to hear. Grandpa understood that Mia and I were building something together, something that couldn't be measured by wealth or social status. He offered his support, telling me that if things ever got too overwhelming, we were always welcome to come stay with him and grandma for a while. It was a comforting thought, but more than that, it was a reminder that there were people in my life who truly understood and respected my choices. The next few months were a bit of a roller coaster. My parents continued to push their agenda, subtly at times and outright aggressively at others. Every family gathering seemed to turn into an interrogation about when Mia and I were going to upgrade our house, or when we were going to start mingling with the right crowd. My dad even offered again to help us buy a more expensive home though this time he framed it as a smart financial move rather than an outright gift. I kept refusing, and every time I did, the tension between us grew. Meanwhile, Olivia kept popping up in my life. It was never anything inappropriate, just the occasional text or social media message, usually about something innocuous like a mutual friend's wedding or an event in town. But it was clear that she wasn't just trying to be friendly. She was fishing, trying to find out if there was still a chance for something between us, even though I had made it clear that I was happy with Mia. Then came the turning point. Mia and I had been married for almost a year when we decided to start trying for a baby. It was something we had both talked about from the beginning, and though we were still living in our modest home, we were excited about the prospect of growing our family. We didn't tell my parents right away, mostly because I didn't want to deal with their judgment about whether we were ready financially. I could already hear my mom's voice in my head, telling us that we should have a bigger house before we thought about kids. But life had other plans. After a few months of trying, Mia still wasn't pregnant, and we started to worry that something might be wrong. We went to see a doctor, and after some tests, we got the news we had been dreading. Mia had some medical issues that were going to make it difficult for her to conceive. It wasn't impossible, but it was going to be a long, emotional journey. The news hit us hard but we were determined to face it together. We started researching fertility treatments, and while the costs were daunting, we knew we had to try. We had about $15,000 saved up, but the treatments were going to cost at least double that. We didn't want to take on too much debt, so we decided to cut back on our spending and start saving as much as we could. It was around this time that my mom found out about our plans. I don't know how she did. Maybe I had let something slip in conversation, but once she knew, she saw it as another opportunity to step in. She called me one afternoon and offered to pay for the treatments. At first, I was tempted. We needed the money, and it would make things so much easier. But then I remembered all the strings that had come with their previous offers of help. This wasn't just about the money. It was about control. If we accepted their help, they would feel entitled to dictate every aspect of our lives, including how we raised our child when the time came. I talked it over with Mia and we both agreed that we couldn't accept the money. It was hard, but we knew that we had to face this challenge on our own terms, without my parents' interference. We decided to keep saving and exploring other options. Just when it felt like things couldn't get any more complicated, life threw us another curveball. One afternoon, I got a call from an unfamiliar number. It was a lawyer representing my grandfather. My heart sank as I listened to him explain that Grandpa Henry had passed away suddenly from a heart attack. The news hit me like a ton of bricks. I hadn't even known he was sick. He had always seemed so strong and full of life. I was devastated. Mia and I drove up to his house for the funeral, and as I stood there, surrounded by family, I realized just how much he had meant to me. He had been the one person who truly understood me, who had supported me without judgment or expectations. Losing him felt like losing a part of myself. After the funeral, the lawyer approached me again, this time with more surprising news. Grandpa Henry had left me something in his will. He had always been a frugal man, and I hadn't expected him to have much, but it turned out that he had quietly saved a substantial amount of money over the years. He had left me $100,000, with a note that simply said, for you and Mia, to build the life you want. I was floored. This wasn't just a financial gift, 
It was Grandpa's way of telling me that he believed in us, that he trusted us to make the right decisions for our family. The money was more than enough to cover Mia's fertility treatments, and it meant that we could finally move forward without the burden of debt or my parents' interference. I called my dad later that week to tell him about Grandpa's gift, and for the first time, I felt a sense of peace in the conversation. My parents, though still disapproving of our choices, seemed to understand that this money was different. It wasn't about control or expectations. It was a gift from someone who loved us for who we were, not who he wanted us to be. Mia and I used the money to start her treatments, and after several months of ups and downs, we finally got the news we had been hoping for. Mia was pregnant. It felt like a miracle, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like everything was falling into place. We had fought so hard for this, and now it was happening. When we told my parents the news, their reactions were mixed. My mom was excited, of course, but there was still that underlying tension, the feeling that we hadn't done things the way she would have wanted. But at this point, I didn't care anymore. Mia and I were building our life together, on our own terms, and that was all that mattered. As the months passed and Mia's pregnancy progressed, I found myself reflecting on everything that had happened. The conflicts with my parents, the pressure to live up to their expectations, the unexpected reappearance of Olivia, and the challenges of starting a family. All of it had tested our marriage in ways I hadn't anticipated. But through it all, Mia and I had stayed strong. We had faced every challenge together, and we had come out the other side stronger for it. The day our son, Henry, named after my grandfather, was born was the happiest day of my life. Holding him in my arms, I realized that all the struggles and heartache had been worth it. This was our family, and we had built it together without letting anyone else dictate how we should live our lives. In the end, I learned that love isn't about fitting into someone else's expectations or living up to an image of success. It's about building a life with the person who makes you feel whole, the person you can't imagine growing old without. And while my parents may never fully understand that, I know now that I made the right choice. Mia and I had created something real, something lasting, and that was all that mattered. As for my relationship with my parents, it's still complicated. They love their grandson, of course, and they've softened a bit since he was born. But the tension is still there, simmering beneath the surface, a reminder of the differences in how we see the world. I've come to accept that we may never fully reconcile those differences, but that's okay. I'm not living my life for them anymore. I'm living it for Mia, for Henry, and for the family we've built together. And that, to me, is the greatest success of all. Subscribe and listen to new interesting stories every day.